All right, joined once again by the man RD357. I think our first interview worked out pretty good, man. We covered a lot of stuff. Um, we talked about your entrance into the graffiti world, some of your beefs. Um, we got a good reception, man. Uh, no, nah, I loved it. Yeah, it was great. I think uh, it was the most well done. Uh, I appreciate thing it. about me. Yeah, yeah, and you know, today. I'm not. Um, I'm not running a really a graffiti channel, but you know, it's got about eight thousand views. So I mean, I think a uh, lot of I a lot of people that. saw it. You know. So I think it's good. So part two today, man, I think uh, we're going to cover a lot of cool things. And um, thanks once again for doing this, man. Um, so I want to start with this, R.D. One of the themes of, of your show that, that I see you talking about a lot is um, you always say this thing. You say there's graffiti writers. But when you talk about your, yourself and some of, the, some of your friends in your orbit, you say we were just we were criminals who happened to write graffiti. Yeah. Yeah. So can you, can you explain what you mean by that? <laughs> well, I've got, I've put it that way because I get a lot of people that, um, you know, talk about old graffiti writers and this and that. And then the fact that my knowledge of graffiti writers like out in Brooklyn and stuff, it's scarce. It falls off because I wasn't out there robbing and stealing like that. And it's pretty much... Graffiti to me was different than your average like garden variety graffiti writer. I was uh, a child that grew up in the streets, got locked up the juvenile centers, met people up there, but other street kids, and um, we were like criminals that were later on started writing graffiti. Like my older brother wrote graffiti. Uh, and then his friend, the Lace, Andrew wrote graffiti, and the, you know all the older cats were already put in graffiti by like '81 or something like that. We were just running around, robbing and stealing as little kids, and we wrote graffiti on the side. Like what I mean by that is, I enjoyed the criminal activity more than doing the graffiti. To me, the graffiti was like jaywalking. You know what I mean? It was like adrenaline that uh, float my boat, so to say. Yeah. yeah, and graffiti is essentially a criminal activity, but you have a lot of writers who that's that's maybe the extent of their criminal activity is just that they do graffiti. Perfect example. Right, and yeah. maybe on the side they're in college, they're going to high school, yeah. but that wasn't you. Yeah, like right. Ket, like Ket, when he got caught writing graffiti, he tried to make graffiti legal on the subways or something. He started a petition like, I shouldn't be in trouble for this, and... You know, as I, I have explained this somewhere along the line, that I was I posted a picture of me standing in front of something I did on the freight train tracks up in the Bronx with my dog. And they said, yo, you know, I got in touch. He said, yo, you should take that down. They're going to come in. You know, that's how they got me. And I said to myself, no, you illegally went into a train tunnel, like disrupting the MTA system, like where trains are moving and stuff. And that's uh, bad to do. You know what I'm saying? And you're writing on it trains that are going to be pulled out of service and this all costs money and money costs right. trouble and, and the breaking of laws and stuff and I told him if I'm standing in front of the Mona Lisa with a paintbrush in my hand that doesn't mean I painted the Mona Lisa you know what I'm saying but to actually sneak into a train tunnel and then have pictures and videos of you walking up to the train and then the train is clean and then you're throwing your outline on the train smiling yeah. and then you're yeah. painting it and then it's completely done and you got videos of it pulling out to a police officer that's an open and shut case <laughs> go yeah. knock on his fucking door that's him like you get me so there's a big difference there but that's how a graffiti writer thinks like he gets caught and all of a sudden he's like oh shit like yo this should be legal like i should be allowed to do this I, well, how, how on earth am i in trouble for this you got me whereas a criminal be like oh they got my ass man fuck it i gotta just work the courts you follow me? Yeah. It's like a different mindset in tackling the arrest, yeah. I guess would be the way to put it. Yeah. It's like, you know, criminals are criminals, you know. Like, even at the end of my arrest, you see me smiling in the newspaper, you yeah. know, the, in the court. You know, it's like, you, you know, chin up, chest out. Even when you're dragging your guts behind you, you, you know, you never let people know you're suffering. It's important in this world. Man. Yeah. Yeah, and you were referring to, you said Ket, Ket R.I.S. A lot of those guys in the early video graphs that were coming out, they were hitting trains like Ket, yeah. Ghost, Ven. Well, I'll tell you, you Carl Weston, clean. he had some good video footage of me. Carl Weston, uh, With yeah, Baron, yeah. I had Baron. If anyone's out there, shout out, see if Carl Weston could probably get that back. But me and D3, we got shotguns and shit like that. That's the same shotgun I pulled down on Bobby Boast. 
RTW up out in Staten Island there. And it's like, um, yeah, we gave him a whole mess of crazy footage, man, with the fucking police down below with me and Baron doing the rooftop. And they're like, oh, like they can't get up to get us. <laughs> and I'm like, he's with Timmy Barron, like, drunk off his ass. When I met him, I got off the ferry terminal. He was laying on the floor sleeping, you know. And Timmy Barron, rest in peace, man. But yeah, I, I had to push his ass to get him up on the fire escape and climb up on the roof. And then the, they surrounded the building. Because it's right there next to the, where the bridge, where the cars travel off. You know what I'm saying? That's the same spot where a maze... And Espo did when you're coming off that bridge. They had the high spot. On yeah, the, on and the I ledge, did it. Yeah. And my D is actually over half of a chimney, so my part of my D comes out like four feet from the wall, but you can't even notice it. I'm that good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Barrett just did one tag of it. Like he slept on the roof the whole time. I woke wow. him up. I'm like, yo, we got a problem. He's like, huh? what? I was like, yo, look, there's cops all over. He's like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, imagine waking up to that shit. <laughs> yo, poor Timmy, man. I love that dude, man. Rest in peace, Barry, man. Timmy Sheehan, man. Yeah, yeah speaking yeah. of Baron, I actually was watching some, like, tattoo show once. I don't know if it was a girlfriend or his fiance was on it, getting a Baron tag tattooed. Have you ever seen that? No, I never did. I'll send that uh, to well, you. Maybe it was Katie. That was his wife's yeah. name. I'll send Katie. that to you. It was on some tattoo show, and it's actually her getting a Baron hand style tattooed on her body. Um, yeah, it had to do with him. Being, yeah, he yeah. was a good dude, man. I'll send that he over was a good dude. He was a big dude, too, man. He was no little punk, man. You know, him and his brother wrote Heart. On the six train, his brother was Larry Sheehan. He he wound up going out to Detroit. I think somehow, Detroit, something like that. He got involved with the grunge, wherever the hell that grunge shit started. Seattle, yeah, yeah, yeah. Seattle. That's exactly it. Seattle. Yeah. I actually had his water monitor uh, when he went to Seattle. He gave me his water monitor, an Asian water monitor. It was actually he told me it was a Nile water monitor, which only gets about four and a half, five feet. But that thing was an Asian water monitor. It gets like seven and a half, eight oh, feet. Wow. I wound up giving it to this guy, Social Tees, down on uh, off of Spring Street. It was a t-shirt company shirt. Like they would print on a shirt, have a good day, just real positive stuff. And yeah. they would also rescue like animals that are uh, reptiles and shit like right. that. The police would call him if they, like, get a drug dealer with a big Burmese python or something <laughs> in his house. He would come and get the thing out. I've given that guy so many different animals. Anacondas, snake, crocodiles, yeah, all types of shit, man. Cayman alligators, American bullhead alligators, everything I've given that guy at one point or another. But, yeah, that, <laughs> that's where it went, yeah. So going back to criminality, I mean, you just said that you pulled a shotgun on somebody once. Yeah. Um, can you talk about uh, the circumstances behind something like that? Yeah, I, I, yeah, definitely. Yeah, but I just want to say one thing: the Asia water monitor, yeah, actually just died like three days, oh, like no way. three wow. years ago. It just died right before, around the pandemic when the pandemic started. And he gave me that thing when I was living in Staten Island, like 1997. That thing just died. Man. I, 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 like I said, I had to give it to this guy, the social teas. And he and winded up in New Jersey and just died. Like it, wow. it was living in someone's like a, a room almost like this. It had a beautiful life. So yo, Larry, I don't know where you at Good nowadays, shit. but yo, that monitor was the shit. Good shit. Uh, what were you we saying? I'm sorry. I just oh well, you you spoke before we were talking about um, being a criminal who just happened to write graffiti, and you mentioned pulling a shotgun on somebody. Yeah. Well, that was Boast. He used to write Boast. B-O-A-S-T. I mean, we pulled a lot of guns out. Breyer got a gun pulled mm -hmm. down on him by us. Um, a bunch of people. But, um, yeah, that was Boast. Bobby Boast. I was living in um, 115 Stuyvesant Place, apartment number 3H. That was the apartment. And I was up for a few days smoking crack. And um, I heard a knock on the door. It's like, don't do anything. Yo, yo, the demon, the demon. And I'm like, who the fuck, the demon? I was like, no shit. You know, I was already up for days on end, like sleep deprivation sets in. I had the shotgun right here, the shells and shit. I had a piece of glass that I was scraping away with, you know, stems and shit. I'm like, demon. How about that? Open up the door and she's like, yo, 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 I must have the wrong apartment. He's dead now, but he was locked up with D3, Sammy in Rikers Island. And then Sammy went upstate. You know, he had to do a bid. Rikers Island is just where they um, they hold you up to a year, like a day under a year. Yep. And if it's like a holding center or an annex. And then from there, you would go to wherever they wind up putting you when you actually have to serve time, time. You go to like a state prison and shit like that. So, yeah, Sammy went up and he got out. And he's from Staten Island. Sammy's like, yo, I'm living out there. You know, Staten Island, this, that. Yo, go say hi to RD and shit. So I never met the dude a day in my fucking life. <laughs> I'm like, yo, what the fuck? 
But yeah, that's pretty much it. You know, I, I eventually was like, nah, I let him in. You know, I let him in the apartment. I hung out with him for a little while and shit. You know. Yeah. So, so having shotguns, pistols. I mean, that was just a part of you. You guys were always loaded up, waiting. I mean, or not me, and not always. Uh, there were people out there that were living like that. Yeah. Like me, I was kind of like a bottom feeder. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I never did shit that could like cause problems, like serious problems. Uh, you know, like I've explained before, I never stole shit that could get me locked up for longer than like 10 years or something. You know, I, I tried to do the math in my head. I don't fuck with people that could like put me in a fucking river. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Uh, you know, you just, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think I've, I was pretty good at stuff like that, you know? Yeah. So in, in, the, in the early 80s, running around as um, a young guy, you fell into the the group home uh, world of New York City. You, you ended up in that system. Mm. Can, can you tell me how you ended up there? What what was that like being in a group home at that time in the eighties? And maybe any any interesting characters you, you ran across. All right. Well, I had family court, eighty Lafayette Street. I was young. I had a bunch of open cases, like. Um, a bulldozer in a river. I got caught for that. I didn't even do it. I don't know how to drive that fucking thing. Um, a pocketbook. A lady left a pocketbook on a bench. You got me? I grabbed it. Uh, just a bunch of stupid cases. I, 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 I sliced someone with a razor. Uh, just a bunch of bullshit. So they're like, yo, you know, the pins petition. They told my mother to sign this pins petition because obviously what a pins petition is is people in need of supervision. So pretty much what they're telling my mother is you're not doing a good job here. The kid's out bugging the fuck out. He's causing problems in society. We can't have this and um, your son's going to wind up getting hurt or he's going to wind up hurting someone or something like that. Like in this assault, he cut someone with a razor, which is actually a dude. It was like, what the fuck you doing coming up to a little kid, man? Have bad intentions. We'll just leave it at that. And I wasn't the one. You know, <laughs> I mean, the guy with the razor, I mean, yeah, you don't want to get into some crazy shit on YouTube and stuff, but I'm sure you, you can imagine what happened. You know what I'm saying? And I cut him with a razor, so I don't think I was at fault for that. <clears throat> But in any sense, my mother did sign this PINS petition, and throughout that time, I was actually being held in Spofford, coming down. Like, I wasn't even from home, you know what I mean, going to 80 Lafayette. I'd come down like a bus and shit from Spofford. And Spofford is a, is a juvenile uh, prison. Yeah, correct? it's shut down now. Yeah. It's been gone for a while. But, yeah, that, I'd say I'd, I'd been to Rikers Island for one month, and, nah, Spofford was sickening, man. That shit was crazy. I mean, I just had such bad, horrible experiences in that place. Like, I, I, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, you know, to be truthful. It, it, it was bad. I remember when I first went in that place. It's like they give you a little, like, a blanket. It's like a gray with like these little red and green strings all in it and shit like that. And I'm sitting in some big ass, like an auditorium area. And everyone sits down. I guess they're waiting to go to where they're being assigned to and shit. And they have a movie playing. The movie was Roots. Mm. Yeah. You know Roots? Yeah. And I'm like, yo, I swear there's like no other white dudes. Like no other kids. That are white. I remember there was one other Rob. I mention him sometimes. <laughs> hey, I bump into him. He had blonde hair, blue eyes. I keep seeing him every so often as going through this system. And um, yeah, I just look at that. Hey, yeah, yeah, that. It's like, so yeah, it was hard, especially when they played that movie Roots. I mean, yeah, people would just fuck with the white boy. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, yeah, that was the way it was played. So yeah, I, until it, you know, it, I snapped. And then, uh, you know, I started gaining respect, you know. But, yeah, it was horrible, horrible. I mean, just imagine, like, a 13-, 14-year-old kid or something like that, you know, you're from the Upper East Side, you know. He thinks he's a badass running around the streets and then really goes in with a bunch of badasses. Yeah. You know, it's horrible experiences. I mean, it was nothing sexual. People weren't into that. Uh, that would be something that was, like, a forbidden taboo. You're like, ew, yeah, dude, you know what I mean? As far as it goes with, like, homosexuality and shit, it was more playing king of the mountain. Like, this is my place, and no, you can't eat. You know what I mean? Like, shit like that was going on. You follow me? Like, yeah. no, you can't sleep in here. This is our place. And No, you can't eat. You know, it was horrible, man. It was horrible. And so I was like, yo, oh, I'm going to die, yo. I caught on real quick, yeah. you know, and I climbed up through there. And that's like a criminal that gains his bones. You follow me? And I'm also, yo, I'm RD. 
You follow me? So it's like RD, it writes graffiti, there. and then it's like you build a reputation from that point on. You got me? Oh, yeah, RD, you don't take no shit, man. You know, oh, yeah, I see him up. He's, he's them crazy white boys downtown. You know what I'm saying? So it's like that's criminals that wrote graffiti, and those are the people that throughout life were graffiti to me. You know what I'm saying? It's like almost like a whole different channel. Than yeah. what is uh, you guys were watching, or not you per se, but the general world. You're introduced to like Henry Chiffon or whatever his name is, and um, you're introduced to these people that write books and their friends and this and that. But you know, of course, the dudes are criminals. Like the mafia don't run around saying we're the mafia. <laughs> you, you get me? It's like you got to stay quiet. So. Me, after my arrest, I figured I, I, I could talk now. Like, I was kind of losing interest in graffiti anyway, and the whole way it went. I mean, you look at the Harley Davidson motorcycles now. You see what's going on with that shit? It's like they're saying they went woke. They've been woke. They are like the woke <laughs> whole, th they are like the beginning of that shit. Like, with stockholders, everyone's like, they went. And it's like, no. Now, imagine how all these Harley Dry Davidson dudes feel, like macho men and shit. Say, oh, shit, you woke. <laughs> you get me? Like, all the Hells Angels and shit. Like, yo, that, and that's kind of like how I look at graffiti now. Like, like I don't know. Like, well, what did I do with my life? <laughs> like, I wasted it on this shit. It's almost like a man that went to war for a country that's, like, falling apart. You get me? At the yeah. end, it's like they spin on him and call him a baby killer or something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, it started out as, like, the Harleys with the Hells Angels, outlaw culture. Then it turned into, like, a weekend warrior kind of fucking guy living in the burbs. Yeah. And he gets a Harley. Yeah. Which is good for him if you could afford it you know whatever yeah. no but, i love harleys yeah. but i would never say that now yeah you know now yeah. i'm like I'm, I'm, yeah i've been on a harley you know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, you, you get me you ain't yeah. gonna say you, you know you, you, you. okay so in uh whether it be spofford or, or group homes or whatever the case may be um did you run into any particularly violent characters or, or any interesting individuals maybe that you heard about later on in life maybe they, they ended up doing something crazy or yeah um Buddha Sherrod, he was uh, the one that shot that cop in Columbus Circle and paralyzed him. Uh, he would never walked again. Uh, he was in Horton. Um, who else? Uh, Pleasantville, uh, Georgie Rivera with Boy George. Boy George. Um, How was he? Now, what was, your, what was your relationship with him? Where did you meet him? He was a cool dude. He was into rock and roll and stuff like that. Um, Drug dealer. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't, you know, I just seen a kid, you know, teenager, you know what I'm saying, Pleasantville. I mean, it wasn't pleasant, that place, but it wasn't bad, like Pleasantville Cottage, it was good. They would have a TV set, and it's, um, Yo MTV Raps came out. Yeah. And they would also have this thing, uh, Headbangers Ball. Mm -hmm. So, I wasn't into rap, I'd watch the Headbangers Ball, and he would watch it too. So, that's kind of like my interactions with him, you know what I'm saying? Uh, mm -hmm. And they're going to make a movie or a documentary about Boy George, right? I something. heard something about that. That's what sparked them into my mind again. I was like, oh shit, I think 50 Cent or something like that uh, is going to make a movie about Boy George. Yeah. Georgie Rivera. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Okay. I don't know if he actually ever like, picked that name Boy George. Like, I don't think he, like me, I said I'm RD. You get me? I don't know. That name might have been pushed upon him because he was also like... Um, he was sleek, man. He was no, you know, like Boy George, I think of the singer. You right. know what I mean? But when you meet Georgie Rivera, it ain't the singer. You get me? <laughs> it's like, uh, it's strange. But uh, yeah, he was apparently, he was ahead of his time from a young age. But when I knew him, I did not know anything about the title Boy George. I don't even believe that existed yet. Okay. I don't think they were calling him Boy George when he was little like that. That came out later on, probably on the drug scene. When people don't want to know, your, you know, people don't give out their real names. You know, it's like PK. Uh, I never knew his real name until like the 90s. <laughs> you know, I was hanging out with him since 86. I uh -huh. never knew his real name. I was always your PK. You know? A lot of people like that. So last time we spoke, uh, I spoke to you about growing up, you know, on the Upper East Side and running around, you know, doing, doing what you were doing as a youth. Um, now at that time in, in let's say the mid 80s there were some uh, interesting characters uh running around this area i want to talk about two individuals uh specifically and, and i'll kind of give a backdrop to these two characters and i, I would like you to t tell the audience about these guys so in in 1986 um august of 1986 
18 year old Jennifer Levin. Uh, She's yeah. found strangled uh, to death in uh, Central Park. Ultimately, they charge a, a 20 year old a young guy, young, tall, good looking white guy, uh, Robert Chambers. And he, I believe, is originally from Queens, and his, his mother moves him to the Upper East Side. He goes to Browning School, and he's this preppy kind of kid. And he gets charged with this murder, and it's a case that kind of takes over not only the city, but, but the country. It's called, the, he's referred to as the preppy killer, yeah. or the preppy murder. Yeah. Um, and this is the woman, and he goes on to say that, oh, uh, we were having some kind of bizarre, rough sex. He kind of turns it around on the on the Jennifer Levin who who's dead, was kind of like uh, getting him to do freaky shit. He said she she had his hands tied behind his back, and ultimately he tries to spin it around. He gets he pleads to a to a manslaughter charge. He does fifteen years. Uh, it's a huge case in criminal history. He gets out of prison, in, I believe two thousand three, and by two thousand eight or two thousand nine. He gets a 19-year sentence for dealing coke out of his apartment in Manhattan. Yeah, yeah. That was right over here, 57. Yeah. yeah. I think it was called 357 East 57. Oh, no way. That's, I believe that's the same building Joey Brennan lived in. Okay. Joey Brennan was the um, uh, game room massacre at the baseball right. bat with the kid in the game room. Yeah. Uh, and then yeah. The, the mafia's money got all screwed up. But he went. He's out now, too, uh, Joey Brennan. But, and it's funny, too, because they were kind of all together too like uh, the Budweiser boys technically that's those guys uh, um, like Mimi's Pizza 85th Street Lexington Avenue Robert Chambers kind of fell into two different worlds and I can relate to it because I did too throughout my life on the Upper East Side like uh, Bernie Murdoff's son and stuff like that and just a lot of people that you meet on the Upper East Side, growing up, a teenager and stuff like that. A lot of influential people, are, are, are big name people would be the word. And he wasn't. Like, he lived very similar like me with his mother. Like, I lived with my mother and my brother. You know, he lived in a household. And his mother had uh, big uh, plans for her son to be successful in life. And, you know, she really scraped everything and did everything she could. I believe she worked for the Kennedys. And uh, she, um, the, the the Kennedys, I forget, uh, little John John. I believe she might have been John. One, I, I, I don't want to go down the wrong road on this, but the Kennedys, it might have been John John, uh, the babysitter. Something like that, to the best of my knowledge. I could be off. But anyway, he was raised in a middle class in uh, this neighborhood. And you would see all these other rich kids, like, flaunting all this amazing shit. And it's like... I don't know what they would go home to dream about, but like we would go home and think about how we could be like them. You get me? And it's almost like they were trying to be like street kids. So you had a fair little fuck, you get me? Where it's like you could rub elbows with them. You get me? And it's like they're intrigued by the danger side of life. And I could explain many issues of girls just getting hooked on drugs and shit like that because they're hanging out up in Harlem and stuff like that. And, uh, I mean, look at even J.A., for instance, you know, uh, John Avelson, the movie producer, and his son. You get me? It's a perfect example of that kind of crowd. So they rubbed elbows with some of the criminals. The criminals could get them weed. You get me? Like the, the street kids. You know, they get them weed. Not, in a sense, some of these the street kids would be treated as gophers. You get me? And it's almost like for the rich, you know, what people do for a couple bucks, you know. And he kind of fell in that category. But he leaned more towards the, the preppy part, just for the fact that it was more beneficial. Like, he had more of a foot in the door than your average street kid did. Uh, you know, his looks, and uh, maybe from coming from a nice area in Queens or something. I didn't, I didn't know about that until you just mentioned that right now. I assumed he was born and raised in Manhattan. But, um, yeah, so he would kind of have a foot in. He had the attractive looks. And he was in a prep school. Like his mother literally scraped together and got some money together. Or maybe the Kennedys helped him go to the school. I mean, you know, they might have been beneficiaries to him or whatever. The, you, you get me? But he actually managed to go to a good school. And it was almost like it was all just wasted because his brain was in the street. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I just don't even listen to what I'm saying. Just think of his actions, you know. And then going back after getting out for murdering someone. And then going back to the fucking cocaine. Like, come on, he had to be on parole <laughs> you get me like that's just that mentality like that mafia boss what was it banana banana colombo one of them 
with the ducks, the yellow ducks that they would sell in the street. They would come out almost like the squeegees. They'd mm -hmm. sell these disco duck type yellow stuffed ducks. They'd sell them out like near the tramway. Certain areas, people would sell them to people in cars, almost like bouquets of flowers or mangoes, or water bottles. They would sell these ducks. And one, uh, one of these mafia guys grabbed one of them ducks. He started running down the street or something. And he got caught. Like and They're like, yo, what the fuck? Like, you had like a couple of thousand dollars in your pocket. And he's like, yo, that's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And it, it's kind of like, that's what he does. Like, he's a criminal, you know? And just at that young age, going through this, the prisons, I mean, it must have been a horrible situation for him. I mean, blue eyes, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. From this neighborhood, I can only imagine. So you can know, you he had to fight his ass off in there, and he just learned more criminal shit, came out criminal, you know. Can you explain, because um, I assume that you were around him a little bit, you, you hung out around him a little bit, you knew him from the area. Um, yeah. Can you explain, you know, being around someone like that, like what, what was he like as a person? Well, you were going to get into someone else, too. I'm going to get into that person also. Yeah, you were yeah. talking about. But with him, I would see him moping around. He would hang out. He, Like I said, he hung out with more of the preppier type of people, like uh, sitting on the steps of the Met. You know what I mean? Like That really does happen. Like, you would see all these movies and TV shows are based on it, like the steps to the Met and this and that. And Yeah, kid, the, the, the upper-class kids from this neighborhood would all hang out on those steps. And at night, they would all drink at Dorian's, the Red Hand. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, another character from from up in this area. Actually, this guy is from Roosevelt Island. For those who don't know, Roosevelt Island is it, it's in the East River between Queens and Manhattan. It, it's officially a part of Manhattan. So a year before Chambers is arrested, uh, a young guy by the name of um, David Philly, Filio, right? Yeah, Dave Filio. Yeah. Dave Filio. He gets arrested for the attempted rape and stabbing of a Columbia University uh, student by the name of Sarah Thomas. He breaks into the Columbia dorms with the goal of, of sexually assaulting this girl. He ends up stabbing her. Now he goes to, to, he goes to court, he goes to trial, he ultimately gets t a 10 to 20 year sentence. But what would come out in the Chambers trial, R.D., w would be that prior to these guys getting arrested, in fact, Robert Chambers and Dave Filiao were cohorts in uh, robbing Upper East Side penthouses. They would rob jewelry, money. So you had these two guys kind of running the streets together, robbing shit, um, not really of the original, the ilk of the Upper East Side. And, and they both go on to do a couple of heinous acts. Um, so can you talk about Dave Filia as well? Yeah, but there was about five or six of them dudes that yeah. did crazy shit. Like, that's just one or two of them that we're talking about now. You have, like, Joey Brandon. You have a bunch of these dudes. They were just weird. But, it, like, yeah, they just took it there. You know, I guess that would be the words to put it. But everyone was robbing apartments. If you listen to my thing, I was talking about this guy, Dave Davidson. And when he showed off some diamonds, I put them in my mouth. And then I walked away with D3. He was showing them off in the park. And then D3 wound up fighting them later when he found out and this and that. But we were all doing that. That's pretty much what we did. They were the ones that got caught. And there was different groups of us that were doing them. Like, uh, we would do that. We would do, we'd steal motorcycles also. Apartments, stores, shit like that, you know. So... <clears throat> it was a normal hustle for someone of that age. Now, he might have been doing better apartments because of his plugins with the preppies. You know, like uh, what, like um, some of the, like the Schwab company or something like that, and different like financial brokers and just the elite. So he had better apartments to rob in certain senses. But we also knew people that fall in the same category and would do the same thing too. But yeah, that, he just got caught doing it. I believe the, he. Originally, something to do with credit cards, too, which is another big thing we used to do with the um, uh, the Home Shopping Club. You know, we get the, the prints mm. from Betsy Johnson's on 60th Street. And they, it's a, a boutique store. Yes. And they would have a little garbage bag that they would have near the cash register when they pull through the, the cash register slips. And they would throw it in that little gray bag, throw the gray bag out. We'd get that gray bag, bring it home, and we'd call the shopping club. And the carbon paper, it would have the number and name backwards. So you flip it around this way, put a light, and you could just say the name and number, and you could buy stuff off that person's credit card with them actually still having their credit card. So they're not even reporting it's stolen. So you could buy all types of shit. They were doing schemes like that, and they were actually winding up with the actual hard fucking card itself and, and doing it, which is a lot more risky. 
because this shit could be shut off while you're purchasing something. That could be scary. And I think that's what might have happened to him. I think he got caught. I, I believe that's what happened to him. He got caught doing some kind of credit card theft thing. I, from what I heard early yeah. on, I think he stole his girlfriend's card or his girlfriend's mother's card or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, ultimately he goes away for that uh, attempted rape and uh, stabbing. Oh, filio, yeah, 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 yeah. and um, filio, yeah. And uh, I think one of the heists that filio and Chambers accomplished was something like seventy thousand um, yeah. dollars. So. So those guys run. Do you have any filio stories? Do you yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, Roosevelt Island guy. So he would come over from Roosevelt Island, hang out on the Upper East Side. It's not a far trip, right across. The no, river. as a matter of fact, all them kids did. Yeah. Like I was saying, Barron Timmy, he was from Roosevelt Island. The kid that wrote Barron that we were just talking mm -hmm. about, him and his brother were from Roosevelt Island. Once upon a time, it was like Welfare Island. Not to knock the people over there, but those were like big projects that were built there. And it was for low-income families uh, to live. And uh, then later on, it became fancy as it is now. You know what I mean? But early on, most of the kids that were there, there were a lot, a lot of teenagers on that island. A lot of kids when I was growing up. Yeah, it was like 30-something kids would be sitting along the water there, smoking weed, drinking and shit. And you know, A couple of them were good criminals, good thieves. A few of them wrote graffiti. Yeah. And Philio was one of them that you, yeah, that you yeah. would see around. Yeah, or, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I didn't know him from the Roosevelt Island crowd, but I knew him from Manhattan. I've actually bumped into him. I was explaining on one of my things that um, I was coming off the Crosstown bus, and I was going to get off it like Mar to go to Mary Arnold's and steal some spray paint, little cans of spray paint. And this is probably like two years before the whole thing with those guys getting arrested and everything, maybe mm. even more. I was in Wagner. I was in junior high school, probably about 13, 14 years old. And Dave Filio used to go to Wagner, too. He was in Wagner at that point in his life, too, probably getting a re ready to re like, uh, graduate. He was like a year ahead of me. Uh, so anyway, you know, walking down the street, broad daylight, too, it was like, I don't know, 2.30 in the afternoon or something, like right around where I was saying, like the Met, the museum. You have 85th Street there, you have 86th Street, 85th, I'm walking down it to go east. And I hear some noise, like shuffling, like garbage can lids and stuff, and like <laughs> <laughs> laughing, and, you know, horsing around, kids horsing around. So I just look over, you know, like they're throwing cardboard at each other, they're horsing around, playing around, that's what street kids do. So I just simply looked over, like, oh, wow, oh, shit, it's Dave Philly on him, you know. And he was with Chris Pisani, that wrote Sadist. So I just pimped over like that. I said, oh shit, that's Dave and them. You know? And he's like, yo, what the fuck you looking at? You know, they ran over and they beat the shit out of me, man. Fucking beat the shit out of me. Really? Fucking punctured my lung and everything. Beat wow. the fucking shit out of me. Literally punctured my lung. Yeah. Like, yo, they fucked me up. And all I did was just look over there. And like I said, I would see him in school. Hi, how's it going? You know what I'm saying? It's like just... Yeah, they were out like that. You it's know? crazy. You never know. Yeah, <laughs> you never know what these people are going to be. Well, that's when I realized, just, like you know, know, I didn't realize the amount of shit they were doing with the apartments until you you had mentioned that. I did know about credit cards, yeah. but you know, I often wondered, like, what the fuck was in these dudes? Like, like they would do evil, like just mean. Like they would be the ones that would rip the legs off frogs and shit like that. You know what I mean? Like yeah. some people are really like that. Like the magnifying glass with the ant hill and shit. You know what I mean? Like they really got off on hurting people. I honestly yeah. believe that. Yeah. Like yeah. some of the shit, I didn't see no money in it. I'm like, okay, someone's dead, but what's missing? You get me? Like what? Like that's the crime? Like that's the fun? You get me? Like where's the grab? The money? Is like, you know, like they were doing weird shit for nothing. Like uh, you, people would pay them to kill someone. You know? <laughs> no, you get what I'm saying, right? Like the, no, there's yeah, a yeah. market for I that mean, kind of shit. Yeah, you man. just mentioned the guy who used to write sadists, but in fact, you know, you got a guy like a filio with Chambers. I mean, these are the real fucking sadists. Yeah. You know, running around yeah. sexually assaulting. Well, Dave women Filio wrote murdering. Dave. He wrote Dave. You know? you know, they all had tags. Everyone had tags. He wrote Dave. Yeah. That's what he wrote. Dave. Yeah. I remember once when that Judas Priest song came out. Uh, breaking the law and Gimbals was on 86th Street and I, I just stole that tape too and it was like that was the, the hot shit out and he was over there he was hanging out he wrote breaking the law <laughs> Dave Rock breaking the law I was like oh that's the shit right that there that was the fucking know? MO in real life yeah, yeah. <laughs> breaking the law yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was hot I remember that shit when that Judas Priest song came yeah. out <laughs> So one of the many uh, criminal ventures that you were partaking in in the 1980s, uh, you, you spoke about 
um, stealing uh, bikes, well, specifically motorcycles, ninja bikes, you know, the Kawasaki, stuff like that. Um, tell me about how that came about and how lucrative was that for you and your friends? And through stealing these ninja bikes, you run into a situation with a character in the New York Italian Mafia who is... Today, known is once again, I mentioned the word sadist. I mean, known <laughs> as essentially a serial killer, uh, a loose cannon, somebody who is, you could say, you could put him at the worst of the worst of all of the mafia characters in New York C City history. Um, a guy by the name of Anthony Gaspipe Casso. I shot him a couple of times. The kid died. Well, what's a couple? Uh, uh, more than a couple. It's a couple. I, I, I really, I don't know the exact amount. Maybe I shot him uh, 10 times, 12 times. Maybe 15 even. It could have been 15. Why? That's Did the that? hatred I had for him. I wanted to beat him with the gun after it was empty. He just tried to kill me. He doesn't deserve anything. That's the law anyway. That was your law? That's the law of the, of, that's the, law of the mafia. Now. Talk to me about the stealing the ninja bikes and leading up to running into a, a guy like that. All right, well, <laughs> it's not that strange because it, when you start stealing shit and you're out there in New York and you're selling stuff to certain people, it's like the mafia's out there. Like every neighborhood, this neighborhood, the Chin had a townhouse two blocks, yep. three blocks from here. You, you know got what caught I'm with a mistress over there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and, I mean, uh, was it 350 Sullivan Street where his yeah. grandmother lived? Uh, I believe 350 Sullivan, no, Sullivan Street. Yeah, they had the and then you had this tattoo parlor called uh, uh, Fun City Tattoos, which my friend Mark Carwin owned. He ran that shit for long. He died just recently, like last year. But yeah, he would be right there, and he would always be goofing around with the chin and shit like that. You know, it's not that weird. You know, it's really. Like, just part of society, you know, it's like uh, every single neighborhood, to the best of my knowledge, is someone, just whether they're out there on Front Street like that or not is a different story. Like, I believe, just like they say, every city block has an artist in it somewhere. That's, I believe every city block's got a criminal. You know what I mean? Whether they're scheming on some money, fucking, uh, like, uh, uh, credit card debt or, or uh, fraud or some shit like that, you know, you got criminals out there. It's just... Eight million you know, stories in the naked city, right? As they yeah, say. yeah, yeah, it's really like that. But anyway, when we were stealing motorcycles, we started um, how that whole thing came about, like 1986, 87, when they started making those big, fast motorcycles, like the Ninja 1000s, the CBRs, the Hurricanes, the, uh, uh, the FJ 1200s. That was the year of like the super bike. It was like, blah, 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 blah. and John John, D3 and them, they were busting, stealing them and shit like that, getting through the ignitions and stuff. And yeah, it was a fucking good market. You know what I mean? It was like we were getting these motorcycles and selling them. We had certain motorcycle stores that were kind of like cool with us. And it was just when you start doing something at that level, you, obviously you're just selling lots of motorcycles. You're going to come up with weird characters, some strange clientele, you know, throughout the years. I'll tell you, BTK, I mean, I met them before that, but yeah, that's pretty much the way it works. You steal motorcycles, people want motorcycles, you don't know who they are, you're going to deliver the motorcycle to them. You know, whoever they are that wants it. Obviously, they know it's stolen, so you're, they're already dealing with a criminal element. You could put that part together in your mind. You follow me? Some people we knew more than other people, you know, but in general, we're just going that blind, almost like how you would sell something on Craigslist. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, that's pretty much it. But it was like, I remember one day stealing like three motorcycles. I mean, I remember wheeling, trying to wheel away a Harley Davidson from in front of the fucking Hells Angels store. Yeah, well, like where their main headquarters was down there on Third Street. In the Venice, yeah. Yeah. yeah, right next to the Sal Academy. It was like it parked. It. We started. It, the guy left the keys in it. He slapped someone five. That was what they did. They didn't shake hands and hug and shit. You know, it was just a quick bat. And he left the keys in it. Went right inside, man. We took it. Started wheeling around. All of a sudden, they came out, started yelling. We let that shit go. It fell down. <laughs> Fucked the whole shit up. And we ran our asses off. But you know, we were really out there like that. So. We had people that would call us uh, to tell us, hey, look, this, that, you know, hey, you know, anywhere we could get a motorcycle like this or that. We didn't fuck with cars because we were in Manhattan. 
You know, there were people that would take cars. You had uh, Joe Limbaugh from up in Pelham Bay and the Mavroidis brothers. They were into taking cars, shit like that. Uh, the Yao, the Flying Hawaiian, he would take cars. He, got, he was the first one to get caught with the Low Jack out in Queens with his mother. When Low Jack came out, it was like that was over. It was over. But yeah, anyway, we would take a lot of fucking shit. And one day, I don't know if I want to get the guy's pizza parlor involved. He's still alive. I believe he's out of prison. But it was a pizza parlor on 68th Street and 69th Street, 1st Avenue. He got caught selling cocaine out of that pizza parlor. I, I don't feel comfortable getting his name into anything. But I should because I believe he set us up. <laughs> like, honestly, he told Frankie Gator. Frankie Gator wrote SQ, squirt, little strong Irish-Italian kid. He's like, yo, I, you know, I know someone who wants a ninja, a ninja 1000. You get a ninja 1000. He's like, yeah, when do you need it by? He's like, as soon as possible, you know. So Frankie Gator comes to the park. I could say Frankie Gator's name. He's dead now. And he's like, yo, John, you know, John, John, JJ357. He's like, oh, I need a motorcycle. Uh, we got to get a Ninja 1000. Let's do this, this, that. And I happen to be hanging out with John, John. So we all go. And we steal this Ninja 1000. So now uptown you had Winky or... I forget. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Winky. He's a dude from uptown. Uh, one of them wanted that motorcycle. I don't know, there's a bunch of people uptown, Asian. So many people on 105th, 106th would buy motorcycles off us, you know. And I forget who it was. It was going back a long time. But we could sell it. And now we got it. And the, guy, he, the guy in the pizza parlor said, yo, just, uh, as soon as you get it, we'll sell it. So now we'll hold on to this thing. You know, we're like, yo, what the fuck, man? We want our money, man. You know, he's like, ah, nah, just wait to stand. Like two, three days passed. I'm like, shit, we could have sold that thing, you know. I mean, we actually went out and stole the other motorcycles and just left that one there and kept flipping them and selling them and shit. And it's like, yo, okay, he's ready. Uh, like 28, like 9th Avenue in Chelsea. Meet him down over there somewhere. So, all right. So, Frankie Gator's on a FJ 1200. It's a Yamaha, a red and white motorcycle, big, powerful motorcycle, 1200. And it's a stamp job, so it's legal, but not legal. Like, what he did is he bought the frame from Camrods, or uh, uh, Twin Cycles. One of them, yeah, Camrods is back then, uh, Mike McCann. And he um, bought the frame and stole an FJ-1200. Took all the parts off of it, the ferret and everything, and flipped it onto that. And that's how he got the bike. That was perfectly legal. He was on that by himself. Now, me and John John were on the stolen Ninja 1000. And John John's driving, I'm holding on to him, I'm holding on the back and around his waist like this. So we pull up to the street, we're waiting, you know. And he goes, vroom, vroom, vroom. I'm like, yo, shut the fuck up, what are you doing? He's like, well, what are we going to do, wait out here all night, let them know we're here. They'll hear it, they'll come down the building, you know. And I'm like, I don't know, man, you're making all this noise, this shit's stories. He's like, who the fuck's going to catch us? And he was always right about that, I mean, it's a Ninja 1000, <laughs> and, you know, it's like, like, 12.30 at night, 11.30, 12.30 at night. And I don't know, Chelsea at that point was really desolate. You had like prostitutes and shit like that. A lot of, you had the, the Chelsea houses over there. It was grimy. It's not like nowadays, you know. I mean, now it's all like the pride thing going on, you know. But Chelsea was a rough area. It was like nasty, like decrepit. Uh, you had a lot of um, like retail shit going on, like wholesale, stuff like that. So there was no reason to make the place look good. People were going there to buy stuff to fill up their stores with like garments and shit like that. The garment district, yeah, which is funny now that I think about it, because the garment district is actually the gas pipe in them, too, if you think about it. That's, that's probably, right, yeah, that was a lot of Lucchese. Yeah, um, that's, yeah. you know, the garment yeah. district, yeah. Uh, that's like their shit. Yeah. Like yeah. he was involved with that. And that's probably one of them buildings yeah you know what i mean there's probably like a sweater factory in there or something you got me but what yeah. happens is uh, yeah the door opens up i'm getting off the the, the motorcycle i'm behind john I'm, i leech this leg over the back like that i'm looking up and down the block he's still looking straight ahead with the headlight on so i'm like this you know what's up he's like yo 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 people on so i'm like well where and i'm looking because the headlights over here but through here it looks extra dark I'm like, wait, he's like, right there, man, they look like, I was like, who are they? He's like, I don't know, they look like some fancy Puerto Ricans or something. Mm -hmm. You know, because, like, the one dude was bopping, like, he was really walking, like, and then when he came up, he was like, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this shit was crazy, like, it was bugged out shit. Uh, yeah, but I, when they walked up to us, I was already off the motorcycle, and John John was getting his leg off the motorcycle while holding it sturdy so it don't tip over, and as he's lifting his leg up, they just pushed him down, and this big dude, he took over the handle of it, Casso came around the side of it, 
I'm looking at John John. He's on the floor. He's going like this, JJ, like crawling backwards out of the way. It's a guy who literally pulls out a 9 millimeter and sh- sh- he smashed me right in the face with like this. Boosh. And I was like, yo, what the fuck, man? He's like, boosh, boosh, shut the fuck up. I'm like, well, I was quiet at that point, you know. <laughs> like, yo. He said, yo, you keep stealing motorcycles out of Gramercy Park. Do you steal motorcycles out of fucking Gramercy Park? Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no. And he's like, boosh, boosh, you're clocking this, that. I was like, holy shit. I was like, no, I don't, man. I'm coming down here to, to sell a motorcycle, this, that. He's like, stay the fuck out of Gramercy Park. You know, Gramercy Park is almost there, too, if you think about it. Like, it's really more east in the middle from the east side. So he's like, stay the fuck out of Gramercy Park. They still know the fucking motorcycle. I know where to get you, this, that, all types of shit. And he left. And we're, like, standing there, like, yo, that's fucked up. Because Frankie Gator literally took off. Once that dude, like, once John John's ass hit the ground, Frankie Gator, rest in peace. But once John John's ass hit the ground and he started crawling back, I heard, vroom, 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 vroom. he got right on the west side of the highway. You could hear it, like, vroom. I was like, yo, what a dick. <laughs> but what's he going to do? I mean, the guy's got 9 millimeter. We don't, you know. So, yeah, they took it, and he just wheeled it right into that fucking building, right when it came out of. It's like a tenement building with, like, the regular vestibule with the little mailboxes in it, and then right next to it, it's like a door, and then there's like a dumpster there, and it's like a, a like a gateway thing. They wheel it right into the fucking thing, and we're like, oh shit, did that really just happen? <laughs> I was like, yo, we got robbed. I was like, fuck, let's go home, like we we're kicking rocks and shit. Yeah, we walked home, and I, like, I didn't know, I mean, I, I remember some shit about, yo, don't you know who we are, this, that, and some shit. But later on, when I'm working as a phlebotomist for the Department of Health and HIV counseling and testing, you know, I'm looking at the newspaper. I see the same guy. He looks a little older. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh, shit, that's the same exact fucking dog. I took the gas pipe, this, that, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, that gives a the violent one. But uh, you got to realize, back then, there was no internet and all right, this right. stuff. I mean, we had phone with long cords and shit like that. The beepers were out at that point, too. You know what I'm saying? But it was not like I'm like some mafia enthusiast right. or no, something. I'm just out there doing me. You know, you don't really pay much attention to shit like that. You know, it's just another person. Like, as far as it goes with us staying out of Gramercy Park, three or four days later, we were robbing motorcycles right there at Gramercy Park. And Gramercy Park is interesting, man. You know, you can put a picture of it. It's like a gated park that's like closed to the general public. Like, you have to live within a certain area, and they give you a key to go into that park, and you can enjoy the usage of that park. And they would have a nice little area right where Park Avenue South is. They would have a nice area there where they always park motorcycles. So we'd always fly by and check, see what they got. You know, certain spots where people would leave motorcycles. Was, Yo, let's see if that Ninja 1000's out there. Boo, boo. And we'd go over. So most of the time, we'd ride around little bicycles. And we'd find a motorcycle. Boom, I'd pump the fucking um, the steering wheel lock. You just put it all away. You put your feet on one on the, 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 the brake part. Push like your fucking squat. Yeah, you hold your feet on, your hands on the seat, and you just do it like a squat. That shit goes, bing, and it breaks. It's just, yeah. it's a little um, cast iron, like die cast, metal thing that goes like this, into a little hole. You go, bing, and it literally breaks. It's like a nail. It's like the thickness of a fucking nail. So that thing breaks. Once that's gone, you got full usage of the fucking handlebar. Then you just take a plug, and cut the wire, and you put your plug in that you have made already. Boom, 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 you're gone. You take off on it. It's really locks on the hand on the the, the 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 wheels that's a problem they used to have the cobra link which is a bunch of weird links with a wire that runs through it we'd take a big pipe and just keep twisting it and twisting it and twisting it and twisting them bing yo them shits would fucking go like a cap and ball gun that shit would go like a slug it's broken windows before yeah. we've done it it's uh, one of them things would fly across the street and break a fucking window that's how much tension and pressure's in it when that cable snaps inside them and it's called the Cobra Link. You can look it up. It's like these links that are over a cable that runs through it. But you can't get in and cut the cable because they're like hardened steel fucking yeah. links. Yeah, no, then you had the regular kryptonites. And that, you just put a big pipe through it and you just twist it. And it, it just, you know, resistance. Or the part that has the lock on it. Yeah, mine's outside. I'll show you. Where you put the key in, it comes out like this before the U. You put the pipe over this and just bend that this way. Yeah. Comes right off like butter, you know. I mean, now they got all types of grinding tools and shit. You also have the crypto, the the um, bolt cutters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can butt snap right through it. You know, with the bolt cutters, you can cut through most chains. Not nowadays. Now they got the 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 
what Brunson steel and the square link chains, all the carbon burned, and real high, high fucking um, hardened steel. Where if I, I've tried it with Dover, broke my fucking bolt cutters on them chains they got out now. Yeah, broke my bolt cutters. So it's just a bang. Yeah. yeah, life's a trip, man. It's like you know whether with you, it's like whether it be uh, you know you come into situations with these people. It, and you never know when you're going to read about somebody in the newspaper, whether it be Chambers, Filio, you had a thing with Casso. Mm. It's, you know, it's... Rudy it's, Sherrard, it, my it, roommate, that shot that cop. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's just wild, you know, what the type of shit that you yeah. ran into. George in Rivera. George uh, Rivera. They're making a movie uh, about him. He was like James Bond, they say. <laughs> no, he like all these crazy compartments and yeah. shit. He's, he got caught on that boat. I think he was with, um, he was with everyone. I, I, a bunch of rap musicians or something mm -hmm. like that opened up. It was a big yacht or something like that. And they, it was like his graduation or something like that. It was all over the news. It was like he, he fucking like, I don't know, like he let everyone in his graduating class come on some yacht and riding around. And <laughs> they took pictures of everyone. Everyone who was on that boat, all of a sudden, somehow like uh, some Rico shit. <laughs> and it's like just little Joey, like they're from yeah. down the block and shit. They got nothing Crazy. to do with anything. I remember reading about it. But yeah, no, nah, he was a wild cat, man. He, they were leaving bodies to them dudes, man. They weren't fucking around, man. They were like Alpo. It was like a Spanish Alpo, you know? I think Alpo had a longer run, but Alpo yeah. definitely was out there longer, which is someone else I knew, Alpo. Really? So going yeah. to that? Yeah, I knew Alpo. Going to Alpo? Uh, lived on the Upper East Side. He'd go swimming in John Jay Park. Uh, Redhead Joey, if you ever yeah. see the mayor, the mayor of Harlem, Redhead Joey, always hanging out with him all the time. Redhead Joey, I was in school with him. He'd come down to the park, they'd hang out, he'd buy motorcycles and stuff like that. Yeah, Alpo. It's funny because, um, I don't know if I should say it, but Redhead Joey actually tried to start a page about that. I think I got into it, but like mm -hmm. all these people like, yo, stay out of black people's business. Wow. You know, because Redhead Joey's white. But, yo, we're like right here on the border of Harlem. Like we hung out like black, white, Spanish, yeah. Chinese, J Japanese, you know what I mean? Like Vietnamese. We didn't give a fuck. So you would see Alpo, uh, what was that? Was you hanging all out with time. him? Yeah, or? yeah, he would hang out. He would just be another dude coming down in the park. Man. Come down on his motorcycle. He bought an NG1000 off us once. He wow. bought a few bikes off us. Yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. But me and John John. John John was closer friends with them than me. Like, they could pal around and shit. You know, me, I was just, like, there on the bench. Same with Red and Joey children, I'm like, on a regular, you know. And I think that would have been a good page, you know, if he would have kept doing that YouTube thing. You know, it'd be like yeah, the story of him, like him hanging out and growing up, going clubbing and stuff like that. Yeah, it's that a shame, man. You know, nice. you hear stay out of black people's business. But, you know, when you talk about New York City, I mean, it's a melting pot, right? You're growing up with Puerto Ricans, yeah, we didn't think blacks, that way. Yeah. Asians. You don't think, I didn't grow up thinking like that. I didn't think that my best friend, I had many Asian friends growing up. I didn't think, oh, he's my Asian best friend. He's my, they're just my fucking friends, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Like, it's it's, like, it's like, like, I watched this thing, even with that kid that got killed out in Howard Beach. Someone had mentioned it when PK and me were live, mm -hmm. you know, about Howard Beach, and like, and they were saying like how the mafia is racist and this, and I'm thinking, shit, on 116th Street, that shit is not true. Like, yo, and they, they're the real motherfuckers that started up here. Like East yeah. Harlem guys. Yeah, yeah. Pleasant yeah, Avenue and yeah, shit. Yeah. Like, those dudes, yo, yeah. everyone is just cool with everyone, man. Yeah. Like, you, out in Howard Beach, that shit might go on. That's another but thing. But even in yeah. Manhattan, like, and in the yeah. Bronx, like, the, the, even the mafia dudes, everyone, we just chill. Like, I'm dead serious. That's no, not no, an I issue, know. man. I know. That's never been an issue in my life. And then I start hearing, oh, yeah, but Alpo didn't kill any of his white friends. And I'm, I'm like, yo, that's the only time I responded back because it's like some 17-year-old kid from Detroit or Baltimore yeah. or something. You know, like, what's he know? I'm like, you know, I was trying to tell Joey, like, who cares? But I guess he was right because I didn't see what was coming down the pipes. Yeah. Like, I didn't know it, the, 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 the world was going to get, like, the city was going to yeah. get like this. So he was smart to pull it, I guess. You know, he wasn't that invested. It's not like he's trying to make money. He's just talking about his friend. He grew up. Yeah, there. you know, I... I, I mean, Alpo's a rat. Yeah, we'll put right. that out there first right. and foremost. But right. I mean, still, you know, he had a life. You know, besides all the shit, I mean, just to talk about it would be interesting. You know, yeah. oh well, he didn't kill any of his white friends. I was like, oh, he ain't kill any of his friends. Like no one up in Harlem, he killed none of the people. He had. Those were like associates and, and like business problems that went wrong. It's just in that business. You don't get fired. You get killed. <laughs> you know, it's not like oh, here's your severance pay. Peace. You got two weeks' notice. Like no, goodbye. <laughs> you get rid of them. You know, like that's just 
that life. That's why I never sold a drug a day in my fucking life. I knew the treachery involved. I've seen it. You know what I'm saying? I, I robbed drug dealers because most of the time they thought I was a cop. They dropped the shit. They get me the shit and run away. You know. What I mean? <laughs> so I mean, I played my cards right. Uh, Kevin Child speaks about that too. Uh, the Don Diva, yeah. the Feds, the crazy white boys from downtown and mm -hmm. shit. Yeah, we do that all the time. Nikki Perry got arrested. So actually, uh, bought a fucking um, fake cop car. From auctions up there on Webster Avenue. Yeah, we drive around, pull up and that shit. You know? It even had like a fake cherry, like he made the fucking thing. Yeah, it was like some plastic piece of a construction site. <laughs> it wasn't even a light. And then inside it, like he painted something red, like and he just put it on the head, you know, in the in the dashboard. Like we didn't put it on. There was no right. light. It was like a fishbowl upside down. Just like, fucking <laughs> <people>. <laughs> <laughs> yo, we would do crazy shit. Yo, I remember doing like, yo, you're not no cop. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> no, I had a sword off shotgun. Yeah. And I was like, what gave it up? Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, that don't matter. Give me your shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that's just uh, for the general people around and not get involved. You get me? It's like, yeah. now it's just you and me, buddy. Run your shit. Up right. it, puppet. You got me? He's like, you're not no cop. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit! Yeah, we had such good times, man. Harlem was fun, man. All right, so, so we talked about you know you running into characters, and then years later you see them in the newspaper. You know, it's a whole fucking mind. It's a mind fuck. You know, it's happened to me too. I've grown up with people, and you lose contact, and then one day they're in the newspaper. Like, holy shit! You start thinking about you know all the times you had with them, or that you knew them, and you say, holy shit! You never know, you know, where people end up, and sometimes that could even hit close to home um in 2014 your brother sean dyer mm -hmm. he's gonna get a 25 to life sentence for the murder of one david shada yeah. um, i'm sure it's a difficult thing to talk about it's your brother he's in prison maybe for life or if he does get out he's gonna be very old in age yeah, that's um, street kid shit. Yeah, know? so can you talk about the circumstances behind him getting that murder charge? I could tell you what I know. <clears throat> I wasn't living there at the time. It was in the Upper East Side as well? Two blocks from here. Two 344 blocks East 62nd Street. Okay. Apartment number 13. He was had a roommate there, and I don't know what transpired. Um... I've heard rumors uh, um, of they were robbing banks in Greenpoint, Brooklyn or some shit like that, and um, they had a problem counting up the money or something like that, but I don't know what happened. The, the one guy felt like he needed more money or not, that's one version of it, but I, I would rather just base with what like I talked to him about on the phone and stuff like that, and yeah, apparently um, a fight ensued and my brother killed him. And um, it's all alleged. I mean, he's been convicted of it, but, uh, you know, I don't want to incriminate him any more than he's been, you know. But for the looks of it, I don't think he's eligible for parole until 2039. Um, when he did that, he had, or when it occurred, he had um, left the apartment and went to his methadone program uh, to get methadone. He was a heroin addict. And he... Um, Came back from the methadone clinic and the marshals were there, the police and everything like that. I think the super went to knock on the door or something. They heard a big fight or something like that that ensued in the place. Or I think he was actually getting evicted or something like that. Yeah, he was, I believe he was getting evicted too. He was looking at eviction. And um, he went in. He, was like, he acted like his key in the door couldn't work or something like that to the best of my knowledge, which could be very so. He might be nervous as fuck. He's about to open the door and it's going to decide the rest of his life you get me he's, he's probably thinking a mile a minute like what do i do what do i do shit let me break the fucking key let me run you get me so he's probably trying to put the key in and fill in he might not have been able to put the key in the door or whatever the case may be they took the key opened the door opened it and according to the cops it was the most bloodiest shit they've ever seen like on the years of working like the place looked painted in blood the guy's head was i mean like flat you know what i'm saying it was like uh a deflated basketball and um, the, the dog there was a big dog there an Argentinian dogo named Bones the dog was covered in blood I uh, think somehow the dog was involved there was bite marks on the person that um, insinuated that the dog had bit him in the past and at that moment 
like there was healing dog wounds on that same person, whereas the, do the person appeared to have been bitten by a dog, maybe not that dog, but it's kind of, I guess maybe through molds and stuff, they could prove the same dog had bit that dude maybe a month or two in advance to that. Like, uh, I don't know what the hell was going on there. I was living here. <laughs> but yeah, so he um, gets locked up for that. And then they take the dog and they do imprints on the jaws and stuff to come up with the conclusions and they asked me you know the dog is free to go would you like to take the dog <clears throat> i said nah i'm all right i i don't want the dog because me and my brother were having a lot of fights it's the reason i moved to here uh, a lot of problems were occurring we were arguing a lot and fighting and the dog bit me several times i got holds on my ass i got holds on my legs and stuff like that from that dog i didn't want the dog i told him no i said but i didn't tell them all that because I didn't want to put the dog in jeopardy. Like, it just didn't like me because of the anger that was coming off my brother. Like, the aura. Dogs are like a fucking fine-tuned violin, man. Like, if their owner is like, they're like, you know? So it's just, if they're, yeah, it's that way. So I didn't want to jeopardize the dog or anything. Eventually, this program took the dog called the Lexus program. Now, the Lexus program, they would adopt old greyhound dogs. Um, race dogs, dogs that were put on this earth to race tracks. When they get too old, they're not winning races, similar to the horses back in the days. They would kill the horse and get a new horse and start having that thing win races because at that point it becomes uh, too costly to keep the thing alive. Maybe they might put it out to stud, like some of these race dogs. They might put them out to stud to make other baby race dogs, but most of the time they kill them. So this Lexus program is a program that saves race dogs. They got wind of this whole story, I believe, um, I forget her name, up in the Animal Care Control on 110th Street. Very nice lady, I've painted a sign for her. Um, I wish I remembered her name, but shout out to her from the Animal Care Control. She was working there and she hooked the dog up with the Lexus program. Those people adopted the dog and kept the dog and got him healthy. They say it's a beautiful, loving dog. Seems to be a little aggressive towards some of the other greyhounds. So she took the dog and gave it to these people in Toledo, Ohio. Toledo, Ohio. Now this lady in Toledo, Ohio was um, an expert in getting rid of aggression in dogs. That's what she did for a living. And in Toledo, Ohio, the woman's father dies. And when the father dies, she buries him, has a wake and everything. And she says when she was at the funeral or at the, the cemetery burying the man, someone broke into her house in Ohio, Toledo, Ohio, and stole the bones. Just took bones. Just that one dog. Now, yes, it's a weird breed for back then. Argentinian Dogo. It's a strange beard breed. Most people did hear me say that name. I'm probably going to look it up saying, what the fuck is an Argentinian Dogo? It's a large dog. It takes down boars and shit like that. The Falcon Islands used them. They cut the vocal cords out of them. They were dog o war. That's what they were labeled. They were like a war dog in the Falcon Islands. Anyway, this lady's got this dog and it disappears when she's burying her father. And the detectives and cops come here bothering me about it. And I told them, I said, look, I was offered that dog long ago. I did not want the dog. I did not take the dog. I've been going to work every day. I'm sure somehow you could look into that and see that I, I haven't left. Like, I would need to take days off or something like that to be able to accomplish this as a theft. I didn't. It's not me. So I said, okay, this, that. I didn't think much of it. Never heard from them again. Then the woman sells the house. And... Someone else buys that house, and they decide to build a swimming pool in the backyard of that place. And in digging it up, they found like, I forget, like 20-something dogs, I believe. Wow. And the end result was like 20-something dogs. And Bones was one of them dogs. It had the microchip in its arm that said, Sean Dyer, my brother. So that's how they actually, and it was labeled the Pet Cemetery. You guys can look it up. The New York Times, I believe, did a story on it. Uh, the Toledo Blade. It's a very popular story. Uh, Bones. A dog was lucky in court, but <laughs> not lucky in ownership. Jeez. Like every owner he had. You got to realize now, Bones is an Argentinian dogo that I got through Reggie. Now, Reggie is the dog man from up in Harlem. Yeah, Park River houses, those big buildings. You see them in the news all the time, the Bloods. 
uh, Young Bloods or something like that. Oh, it's, it's really crime ridden right now. It's bad. That place is like probably the worst in all the five boroughs at this point. But anyway, Reggie, the dog man, was from there. He, was, uh, 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 he worked at Captain Haggerty's once upon a time, which is a dog security company. If you're an armed guard and you have a dog with you, and he would train dogs for that. So I would steal dogs with him. Uh, many occasions I took these two solid black uh, Rottweilers. They're German Rottweilers. And he owed me for that, and he owed me for a couple other dogs. So now he was telling me about this Argentinian Dogo, which was Bones. This is how Bones winded up in my brother's life. So now Bones' owner was from up in Westchester. And he was getting convicted of a crime where he would be in jail longer than a dog could possibly be alive. So he gave the dog to Reggie to find it a home. So now I felt like I was losing face here because I already, some of these people already owe me for three or four dogs. And I'm starting to feel like I'm getting jerked around. So I'm looking at this dog. I'm like, oh, that shit is dope. It's like a huge pit bull. <laughs> it's like a big fucking, like a Great Dane on steroids. You know, so he's like, oh, take it. So I took it and I gave it to my mother. And that, that was as a joke. My mother, the old Irish woman, she loves dogs. So I knew my brother was there and he would take care of it and all. But my mother had died and my brother winded up with the dog. So, yeah, it was a real tight bond with those dogs. And it's also important for me to say they do not exchange hands well. Like, if you have that dog, you'd be better off putting it down and giving it to someone else. It's almost like yeah. once it's wired a certain way, you know. So the dog was really quick and very, very aggressive when it came down to it. I mean, yeah, you could, there was cases of people that were getting bit by that dog right up the block. Uh, this guy with a German shepherd that lived there. He was a dick. He would have a German shepherd off the leash and come running down starting some shit. Bones would take that motherfucker down. The asshole tried to separate them. So the dog broke his fucking arm. Like, literally... <laughs> Like broke, you know what that's like? That's yo, look that dog up, man. I will. Those yeah. are some dogs, man. But uh, yeah, so the lady um, apparently killed the dog. They say the dog died from st starvation. Mm -hmm. There's a whole, you could, there's a lot of it on the YouTube, on Google. You could Google it, but yeah, it died from starvation. Like uh, according to the doggy autopsy, it's like the dog was like 13 pounds. Wow. Originally, when we had it, it was like 120 pounds. Jeez. Yeah, and it was like that skeletal. They're like, of course, a lot rots and decays and stuff. You know, the dog was rotten and dead. I think they wrapped him up in a pool line or some crazy bag or something like that. But still, they could tell. Like, scientifically, the dog was malnutrition and dehydrated. So in other words, the fucking lady just locked the dog in a cage and just kept collecting that money to train the dog to be a, you know what I'm saying? Like, yo, what is that? Like, some kind of training mechanism? Mm -hmm. Like, to starve the dog? Like, that was some crazy shit. I some felt life. so bad. That's I feel some... like I should have took that dog... That's something like I'll probably take with me to my grave, man. Yeah. Like, should I have taken the dog or not? But imagine if I did take the dog. It ripped me apart, ripped my son apart. I mean, that dog loved my brother, and it looked at me as the enemy. Me and my brother were constantly arguing in that household. You know, the cops are called all the time. I, there's plenty of police records proving that shit. The neighbors so, call the cops almost every weekend on us, you know? So similar to the case <clears throat> with this guy, David Shatter, who, who your brother was ultimately convicted of murdering, in 2014, similar situation. I guess him and this guy is always arguing, and it was probably a similar thing. Yeah, um, he's dead. I don't. The father, no, yeah, I know, the guy's yeah. father, actually reached out to my brother and is like a very religious man and is forgiving and is yeah. actually probably supports my brother more than I do. Imagine that kind of man for his son. Wow. You know, but yeah. apparently the guy had problems with drugs, as did my brother. Yeah. So, I mean, I remember me myself just smoking crack in, in the houses like in Washington Heights. And shit. It's like when we start running out of shit. And it's like, so I realize I'm the only one there. Like, I'm the only white boy there, first off. Second off, I'm the only one that don't have a gun. <laughs> I'm like, I think I'm going to go, guys. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, yo, like, look at a boast out in Staten Island with the shotgun. Yeah. Like, sleep deprivation sets in. Yeah. You know, it's a recipe for disaster. You start hallucinating. It's yeah, when you start year. mixing yeah. drugs with violent criminals and yeah. shit like that, it's a recipe yeah. for disaster. Yeah. It's not going to end the good. You get me? It's like, yeah, it's... It, yeah. it's it, it becomes more possible than impossible if someone winds up dead. I mean, look at all those Budweiser boys and all the stuff we're talking about. You know, just alcoholism. I mean, just everything you could think of. People driving the cars, run someone over. They don't mean to do it. Yeah. You know? And I believe some people just they get real angry and they can't control their anger. And before you know it, they're looking at a dead body. Jeez. And they're like, oh, shit, I killed them. You know? 
I know people have punched people in the face and the dude's head hit the corner of the fucking bar and the neck bounced off the yeah, bar stool yeah. dead. That's one the of the worst like, things oh, you can shit. do. That's one of the worst things you could do. I mean, we, yeah. you, you, you look at the news, I don't care what state it is, every month it's a story. You get into a fight with someone or you get impulsive. Oh, I'm going to sucker punch this guy because he was looking at my girl. A guy falls on the floor, cracks his head open. It actually just happened in Brooklyn uh, out of, uh, there was a road rage incident. Huh. Guy gets out of his car. Punches this Chinese doctor, well-respected heart doctor, in the face. Fucking guy falls. Now the guy's dead. Now the guy's got a homicide charge. I mean, so yeah. I just it's not worth it, you know. I think it's out in Queens it. with this yeah. guy. He was trying to get rent for his apartment. He, yeah. he owns like a, a, a like a three-family house, and he's renting it out. And yeah. you know, through the pandemic, the guy just pushed him like this. He went right down the stairs. Yeah. Boom! Busted his head it, so. like a yeah. melon on the sidewalk. It's not worth it. So anyone listening, I mean, I'm not trying to tell you what to do, but you know, before you put your hands on somebody, you know, just. Just yeah. realize, you know, you think it's just a punch in the face or a slap or a push. It could turn to a murder in fucking five seconds, mm. you know, and then you scream. I mean, even just me riding my bicycle, I, I get in fights with people all the time. Yeah. Like cars that cut me off and stuff. I mean, I'll pop his fucking tire and keep yeah. it going or something like that. <laughs> but, I mean, it's like, yeah, like, it, that's the way it always happens. Like, yeah. uh, seconds of rage causes your life gone, you know? Yeah. So this has been good. I mean, before we get to it, you know, because everyone knows you as a graffiti writer, I wanted this part two interview to not really be much about graffiti, more about your life. Mm -hmm. And I think we accomplished that. But I think we will close it out with some graffiti. I think that would be cool. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about. Uh, I want to ask you about a couple of things you spoke about before. A couple of characters. Um, one character I want to talk about. This is a guy who comes out of my area of Queens. Now, these guys are older than me, but the, there are people, like, being interested in graffiti growing up. I looked up to these guys. I thought they were cool, you know. One of the guys in particular is a guy who went by the name um, Corn. He had his own crew, COK, but mostly affiliated with the Smart Crew, one of the guys at the helm of, of the Smart Crew. Uh, this was a guy who I saw up, up a lot growing up. Kind of an interesting character, um, graffiti writer. Mm -hmm. Turned, uh, turned like poker champion. Turned, I don't know if anybody listening used to watch the Brooklyn Nets when they first moved to Brooklyn. He almost became like the human mascot for the Brooklyn Nets. He was going by the name Jeffrey Gambolero. Mm -hmm. He was in all their promotional material. He was dancing around in the Barclays Center all the time. So he was kind of like becoming like a larger than life personality. And I think in the graffiti world, he already kind of had that. Um, you know, I was a fan of his. I collected his work while he, when he was still alive. And many people know or may not know, but he also had a prosthetic leg. Um, yeah, yeah. I heard stories as to how that happened. I don't want to get into that. But you told a story about you had a little beef with Corn Smart Crew, and y y you found out that he, in fact, had this uh, prosthetic leg through mm. through this situation. So can you go into to that little tiff you had with Corn? First, I'd like to say, yeah, I could definitely do that. But first, I'd like to say, you got to realize Corn with one fucking leg. Yeah. Like, dude, that dude was like, climb the fucking bridges. Subway and shit. He tunnels. would do shit I wouldn't fucking yeah. do. Yeah, he did. Oh, you tell me not to whop this thing. I whopped yeah. the fuck out of it. <laughs> That's all right. But, yo, know, this dude would climb the Hellgate Bridge. He would get that spot. Like, yo, he That's did the right. fucking Hellgate That's Bridge. That's right, he did. Yo, one fucking leg. Yeah. Like, yo, <laughs> yo, he climbed billboards like these people are doing now, yeah. like spraying them. Yo, that motherfucker's one of the originators. Yeah, he did, of that he did shit. a lot of uh, tunnel missions in the yeah. late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah, they're one of them fucking, he's one of them original rooftop killers, man. Him, Skate, Tabs. Yeah. All them dudes, those are like original uh, NATO, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Like Bruce, like yeah. the dudes that were killing the rooftops. He's up there with that shit, man. He and one of the guys really that got up with a with not so much letters, but almost like a symbol. He had the K, it was kind of like a character that he was getting. Was yeah, like, with, yeah. The eye, with the sunglasses yeah. or the eyes. Yeah. Yeah. But just to think with one leg. And yeah. you know, that shit was tight and crisp. Yeah. Like, yo, I love them fucking Ks. Yeah. Like, I got nothing against the guy. I got nothing bad about the guy. But apparently what had happened is... I met this guy, Skay. Now, what happened, Skay was from around Queens area there. And I was going out with this girl. I was about 37, 38 years old, maybe. She was like 23, 24 years old. And I had a house in Queens. And I, I sold it, obviously. But <laughs> I had a house in Queens. And she lived out uh, 51st Street, Woodside, somewhere. And um, we would meet, and this guy, Chris Riggs, he's a street artist, I guess, or an artist or whatever. His brother was Yes. Anyway, Chris Riggs. Yes, P-O-W or Yes? Yes, uh, P-O-W. Okay. That's his brother. Yeah. Um, anyway, he would take, he had a van, 
And there was a couple other guys that stood the road. Disney, a few of them, FL or FPP or something like that. A couple of these guys that wrote graffiti and stuff. So we'd all go into the city and we'd go partying. They were into, uh, well, a girl, her name was Erica. She was into like kind of like goth clubs and shit like that. And uh, they would go to all these weird things like uh, the clubs. I was a little older, so I'd kind of just sit off to the side and hang out. Anyway, one day she was telling me, hey, look, um, there's this new guy that's going to be coming with us uh, he writes graffiti. And I said, who's that, Ghost or EA? Because I beef with them, you know. And she laughed. She said, no, he writes Ske. And I had never heard of Ske really much at that point, you know. So I'm like, Ske. She's like, yeah, he's the guy that runs around with corn. And now corn I heard of. I'm like, oh, wow, that's cool. I think, you know what it is? The Ks stand out. Yeah, they certainly like, do. Ske might have wrote before him and been doing this shit, but those Ks really stood out. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, wow, I, I remember that corn guy. Yeah, yeah, he's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like, yeah, whatever. What the fuck? I don't, you know, I don't care. So he hops in the van, and we go out clubbing, exchange our numbers and stuff like that. Cell phones were around at that point, but they weren't like what we got nowadays with all the Googling and shit like that. And um, he called me the next week, and we started writing graffiti. And, like, we started going hard. Like, if you look at Graphaholics, there's a whole yes. thing. It's like, it's speeded up, and it's like, all, it's like yeah, we were doing these big, huge fillings, like, right on Front Street, like, all over, like, Brooklyn and Queens. And uh, when I was doing that, Skay was Korn's bombing partner. So now I believe Korn got upset that he was hanging out with me. I can only assume. You get me? I don't know. The man's dead now. But um, I never discussed it with Skay. I really don't even talk to Skay anymore. I don't get along with the guy. But anyway, that guy, Korn, apparently was upset or something like that, drinking and shit. It was one of them days where we came by with that van, and they were leaving us off there. And he came up to me. It was right near Cat's Deli, right around Cat's Deli. I think someone said it was on Delancey Street. The, 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 the people that brought up, yo, I remember this on Delancey Street. I'm like, no, that happened on Houston Street, I believe. You know, And that's how the story, I, I put it on. But yeah, it was right around near Cat's Deli. Down one of them streets, you had like the Ludlow Bar or something like that. And then you had this little place that you go down the stairs. And it was like rap music that would play. I think we were going from one to the other, the Ludlow Bar and the Fish and bait thing or something like that or whatever. Max Fish or something. Yeah. yeah, some crazy shit like that. It was a long time ago. Ludlow Bar. Um, it's right over there like where uh, A-Life Okay, was. Rivington. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 There's Ludlow, the, the yeah. Ludlow Bar, a, a Lilo Bar, whatever. Anyway, somewhere around there and we're coming out and he's walking by and one of the people that ride in the van recognized me. Hey, what's up this thing? I still had never met the man at that point. He's like, yo, <clears throat> you've fucked up just that. I couldn't understand what he was saying. And I, I believe he actually had liquor in his hand when he was talking to me. Oh, this, uh, blah, 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 real nasty shit. So I was like, yo, this is bullshit. I'm going to fuck away from this guy. I mean, I don't want to hit him. I'm with the girl and stuff like that, you know. But he was just real drunk and obnoxious. And he swung and he, and he missed. And his whole body swung. And the leg kind of stayed there. And then it fell down, you Jeez. know. <clears throat> And I didn't even try to help him up, man. He fell right on, on black garbage bags near a meter. And I was like, dude, man, come on, man. You're making a fool of yourself and this and that. I couldn't hear what he was saying. I, I mean, I'm not trying to be a dick. I'm just being truthful. I got nothing but good things to say about the dude. I don't know fact he tried to take my head off. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he wasn't, it was just, he was drunk. And I, you know how people react and when their alcohol gets involved and stuff like that. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. But... Um, and there was a story that they, him, they were saying that you threw his leg or something. Yeah, like. that, that I did do, yeah. Okay, okay. I, I went, I, I took it, and I tried, like, you know, like, I picked it up. Like, yeah. I ought to go, like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you motherfucker, you know, because he was still popping shit. I'm trying to help him up and give him back his leg. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you motherfucker, I just threw it out in the street. Yeah. I walked away. Yeah, I left it. Yeah. yeah, and you know, like you say, you don't want to talk, rest in peace to corn. I thought he was pretty influential. And uh, that was also around the time, I don't know if you remember, they ended up on Fox 5 News. There was a bunch of them. I don't know, if they, they were kind of trolling a little bit, and corn was, was on Fox 5. There was a whole thing about it. I'll post <laughs> no, that, that video. No, that dude's fucking a trap. If you cross out my, sh my stuff, I'll hurt you. And my friends will hurt you. You want to kill them, right? You want to get rid of him. He calls himself Corn. It's not his real name, but his tag name. And this is his work. He wanted us to protect his identity because he's been in trouble with the law many, many times.
I'm a punk. I'm I'm anti-society. I don't like the government. I don't like the police. I, mean, I don't know nothing uh, about yeah. that basketball shit. But I heard like he was a fucking like a, like he became like a like a amazing poker player. Yeah. Like you know, I knew this dude Ginky that made a living off a of fucking pool. But like, imagine poker, man. That's like just straight up like pool. I believe is more strategic. Poker is really a game of luck. Like how the fuck do you get? I mean, you yeah, Texas hold them, yeah. Yeah, and you can do like poker face and shit. You can yeah, tell yeah, if yeah. someone's lying if you get good with, with body language and stuff like that. But I don't think he did that. He barely had a whole body. Half his, his fucking leg was gone. You know what I mean? It's like just like where does someone obtain that kind of knowledge? And then that kind of balls to climb and do those spots with one leg. Yeah. Like yo, you that's crazy shit. Yeah. That's crazy shit. That's a fucking amazing fucking human being. Yeah. And that's not, you didn't even get into like I don't know nothing about sports, but yeah, yeah like Jesus fuck. Christ, he had like three lives. Yeah, right? yeah. Think about it. He had like three Seems identities like in yeah. life. It's Very, amazing. Uh, an interesting character for sure, man. So before we close it out, let, let's go back to the beginning. Let's talk about before to close it out. Let's talk about criminals who wrote graffiti. I asked you something recently in a live stream. I said, RD, have you ever had any incidents, or what is your opinion? on the TMR crew. This was a crew that was born out of an area that I'm from, you know, into the 80s and early 90s, uh, out of Bayside, Queens. Uh, they had, such a, repu true, they had yeah. such a reputation that in 1990, they ended up on the cover of the Daily News. <laughs> these crazy kids from Bayside, these criminals who just happened to write graffiti. Yeah, oh, they but, yeah, too. But Is that in the article? It's well, no, I don't know if they said oh, that just, the Yeah, yeah, tell but, what I say. You know, it's basically, they were painting them as this violent gang of made up mostly of white kids. Of course, you had some Asian, Spanish kids in there. But they painted it at least crazy white kids out of Bayside, Queens that are so violent that we're going to put them in the cover of the fucking Daily News. And I asked you about that, guys like St. TMR. And of course, there's other ones like guys like Crow or Pastor or some and of these Scent. other guys. Scent TMR, yeah. of course. Cy, well, he's later on. Cy, 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 Cy you know, another guy with an interesting story. I won't get into that. Cy yeah. TMR, but tell me about you. You had a little incident with TMR back in the day. Tell me, tell me about that and your opinions on on, on that crew. I, well, how that whole beef started was once again. It just kind of trickled off from that JA down under, like they were under the tunnel air, like with uh, Ghost and them. And he hung out with Ghost and them, and it's just. They were going over us and shit. We were going over them down below. But those were the only dudes. Like, they were fucking with us on the trains. We were fucking with them on the trains, you know? And no one was really coming out ahead or behind. It was kind of just even Steven. We'd do something, they'd cross it out. They'd do something, we crossed it out, you know? So, um, they started coming around our area uh, in the cars and shit like that. Uh, John J. Park, it's like a dead end. And it swerves up as 77 to 78, and then you got to go back up to York Avenue. It's called um, Cherokee Lane is the name of the street. So they'd swerve down there. Hey, hey, motherfucker. And we'd be sitting right there on the benches right there. So they like, wing a bottle at us. Yeah, TMR! Yeah. <laughs> they take off, you know. So we'd like, that motherfucker, where are they from? And this and that. So we know someone that knows someone that says, yo, they from out here or something like that, you know. The KK or Ripe or one of them. But anyway, you know, we go out there and they would do the same shit to them. We'd cross them out on the highways and stuff like that. And one particular time, it's, I believe, I, yeah, you're the person that did the comment that got me talking about it. But yeah, one time it's like a beige wall. Grand Central, a Long Island Expressway, whatever. And we pulled up and it's probably about 15 feet, 20 feet. The wall is tall as beige bricks, and it's got trees lining around it. And every so often, there's these big spaces of wall. And the grass was probably about a foot and a half, two feet tall. Normally, they cut it down and everything, but this particular time, they didn't. So I'm doing a fill-in. JJ's doing a fill-in. KK, Ripe, we're all lined up just doing fill-ins on the wall. Well, when we're writing like this, I don't know, am I still on the screen? Yep. You know, I'm writing like this, and John John's next to me, and shit. You know, we're filling our shit in. And all of a sudden, like, I, I think John John saw it first, but out the corner of his eye, it was like, Phew! like something hopped off or, or something. He was like, yeah, I could have saw something. But it's like nothing because you see his grass is this tall and it's late at night, two, three in the morning. You know, so he's like, yeah, I think I saw it. I was like, we didn't pay nothing to it, you know. So then all of a sudden, someone at this end is like, yo, someone just dropped off the wall. You know, they're like someone <laughs> jumped off the wall over here too. So they're jumping before us and after us. Okay. You get me? Like, Phew! Phew! <laughs> so we stood back and was like, the dude jumped right in front of me, like, yo! 
<laughs> some ninja shit. I'm like, oh, what the fuck? And you figured even if they're six feet tall and they hang drop, still yeah. they're dropping a good ten feet. Well, nine I'm sorry, feet. you mentioned it was the Cross Island. Uh, yeah, on the said? Long Island Express, whichever's bra- beige bricks. Okay, yeah, it was yeah. beige bricks. Okay, so somewhere and, in Queens in that area. Yeah, the, the road is up above where the cars yeah. are parked. Okay, yeah. You got me? It's like the cars are parked up there. They hang out there. For them to happen to be there, what we're doing, we're doing. Like, they hang out there. Like, they had to be sitting on a bench right yeah. there drinking beer. Someone's like, hey, Charlie, they're right in the cross from us out down there. Like, literally, that had to be like our John Jay Park where they would come down to us. Like, it was right there because how, what's the coincidence of them to be like that? Yeah, like to just start dropping off the wall like it's literally we had to be right in their backyard yeah if it was lie or cross island specifically like north or northeast queens it was definitely would have been an area where those guys are it's yeah. the etymology of kind of that crew yeah, that yeah yeah so it's like they're just a foo, one falls yeah. off foo, foo, foo. and it's like yo i'm like oh look i fuck out of here i remember kershaw uh, he grabbed the paint and started going no he grabbed the big radio he had and then john john starts running we're all running back to the car i think Wright got in the car first he's the driver of it uh, KK was there a bunch. I was just telling you about KK. I just showed you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. but uh, so we all have getting in the car. And I get in the car. Now the window on the it's a Trans Am. Like you know, Trans Am's with the big gold bird on yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, Cannonball Run, uh, Hooper shit like that. Yeah, it's Smoking that kind of a bandit, car. Yeah. Smoking the Bandit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it with the 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 bird on it. Yeah. And yeah, that's what we had a black one with a gold bird on it, and uh, we're taking off. One of them's got John John actually by the shoulder. And like, say this is like a can of spray paint, you know, like the bottom of it. Yep. John John takes it like this and just hits him. Right? Like, ah, yeah, right in the face. Like, Bush. So the guy lets go and grabs his face. Obviously, he's bleeding and shit like that. Oh, John John runs and gets in the car. Now they come up, they got like tire irons and crowbars and shit like that. And they're banging on the car and shit, throwing rocks at it and stuff. <laughs> We're trying to take off. And Kershaw for who wrote Mike 173, he's an old school dude, uh, he had a radio, and he put it up over the window, because the thing to the window, I don't know, like he couldn't get the window up, it's just easier to grab the fucking radio, and you know, they bashed that shit, and they bashed all the big batteries, they fit in like the boom box, they all fell out, then they started picking up the batteries, and throwing them, and it actually broke the back windshield of the car, like one of the batteries, Jeez. and he's like, yo, you owe me a pack of batteries, like after it was all said and done, and he's like, yo, you owe me a windshield, like they wouldn't have been able to break my window if you didn't leave your batteries in the fucking highway, you know, it's a funny little thing, but yeah, we were getting the fuck out of there, we got, drove past, and they started following us. Like, they, were, they must have had enough time. Like, if they're popping off here, they must have just going to the exit. To start. And they came up, man. They were right behind us. They were fucking going for a few exits. We went, and then we swerved off, and they swerved off, too. And Ripe was just making all these turns and shit. We wind up in a dead-end street. Like, we winded up against the gate with the highway down there. You, you know, like, how those streets go? Yep. They come to the end, and then there's that big wall. Like, we ended up like that. Like, we ended up at, like, just a gate and, like, a street. And, like, we could see down at the highway. It's like, we're fucked. So we turn around like this, and we see, whoo, and they went by, we I think they passed us. Then all of a sudden, they start coming back in reverse, and shit, oh, like, oh, shit. fuck. But we were in the car, you know, so like, oh, shit, what are we doing? He's like, well, I remember Kirk's office, what do you mean, what do we do? Go, go, go. He's like, yo, well, if they don't get out the way, you know, I don't want to hurt them. This time. He's like, no, they'll get out the way. He's like, because they paid for that car. You know, ours is not paid for, you know, <laughs> you get me? It's like, yeah, it's like just something, I mean, I believe... He owned that car, but it's not owned it, owned it. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. like, like he didn't give a fuck about it. It's something he built. Like, you get the frame, like, stamp job, shit like that, you know? A used car lot or something crazy shit like that. But, yeah, so we went, and they got out of our way. Bigger and shit, we just kept going. And they, woo. And a couple of months after that, eight, nine months or something, you know, we read about it in the paper, like what you were saying. Yeah, at that point, John John was already dead. Yeah, wow. JJ had passed away. Yeah, uh, that came out in the paper. And you've since, I know in the past couple of years, you, you did something with Saint. You guys did a wall together or yeah. something. Yeah. I, I, yeah, 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 I did that. Uh, JJ, he passed away in a motorcycle accident on a stolen Ninja 1000. Oh, shit. With Frankie Gator, but Frankie Gator lived. Wow. Uh, he's the one that, you know, that I was doing that shit with, with, with Casso and them, you know. But Frankie Gator actually lived that. He redo his whole leg. He had all these metal Jeez. things in his leg and shit like that. And he's dead now, too. He died from an overdose, I believe. Uh, like a year or two ago. But yeah, what were you saying? I'm sorry. I, no, no, that was just listening. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. um, damn, TMR guys, they ain't fucking around, man. I bumped into them, uh, well, Skid, he uh, hooked me up, uh, went and did a wall out in Brooklyn. It was okay. Saint, me, 
Cy uh, Hocus or Hoax? Hoax, yeah. Yeah, Hoax. Uh, we yeah. did a wall. There's pictures of it floating around. I could send them to you. Yeah, if you want. definitely, yeah. definitely. Um, Nah, no problem. I like those guys. I think they're cool, you know. They remind us of us, you know what I'm saying? I mean, but the only difference is we're like in the tenements like this. Yeah. They're in like probably houses, I believe, from what I understand. I could be wrong. So it's a little different. Like here, we don't have much grass or greenery other mm -hmm. than Central Park. Or, you know, you got the river down there. But other than that, yeah, it's a little different, but almost the same. Yeah. Uh, like the krill, the grabs are probably different because they're probably not in a city city. I'm not familiar with the wall like houses. Yeah, and that might have been why they even had them in the newspaper because you get these these guys, these young teens, you know, they're from this nice area. You know, in that area, you got Bayside, you got Whitestone, you got, mm -hmm. you know, those are middle to sometimes upper middle class to sometimes even just wealthy, you know, in certain areas mm -hmm. of there. Not to say that everybody, because I grew up there, I'm, we certainly weren't like, you know, we mm -hmm. certainly didn't have money. So you have your share of apartment buildings in that area, but it's more of a middle to middle, upper middle class area. And um, I guess that that was the, uh, that was the appeal for the Daily News. Oh, mm -hmm. these upper class well, white kids. Oh. I know later on, someone told me that the, the person, John John Hitt, that was that dude, Mirage. That does oh, the really? footsteps. Yeah, Mirage. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. the yeah. person. Uh, they're both dead now. Yeah, he passed but, away. Yeah, younger, yeah, right? that's yeah. the person, I believe. Um, I always thought he was from Long Island or something. But I guess that's almost Long Island. I don't know. I'm yeah. bad with that shit. About 15, know? 20 minute ride. Yeah, so it's not it's, bad for him to hop on. I don't know. Was he, was he from that area too or what? You know, Mirage... I don't know. I knew that he from just from knowing some of the history of where I grew up that he was in he was in with those guys, but yeah. you know, I don't really know much about. It. There really is not a lot about him out there. Yeah. Cuz if you think about it, he walked in a, he bounced to a different beat would be no term. Like those guys they weren't hitting the twos and fives, but Mirage was. Like you know what I mean? Like I, to the best of my knowledge, I think Saint might have had a little insides and stuff like that. But um yeah, like have a big presence on the IRT line mm -hmm. when they're at Queens, you get me? It's like the IRT is where people would do burners and pieces yeah. and shit like that. So he was mixing up. He was doing yeah. burners and pieces on like IRTs and shit like yeah, that. And you know? Some With of the, the photos, feet. yeah. Yeah, so he was like a little different than them, a little more out there in the graffiti spectrum almost. Yeah. Like they were, they were doing shit, but they're more like BMTs, INDs and stuff. Maybe the Sevens too. Yeah. They might, yeah, Sevens and IRT. I don't know much about their career. I just know they, they, you know, they were fucking with us. We were fucking with them, and you know, it was all good. It's just teenagers being teenagers, you know. Yeah, and as yeah. far as the Mirage, I guess one of the most famous pictures you see of his graffiti. It's like a huge straight letter blockbuster. I think it's on the Clearview Expressway, like a big silver fucking Mirage, big letters, you know, straight yeah. letters. And it's got the feet, feet after it or before. It Probably, or yeah. I got there's one with the feet it. after it or before because yeah. there was one like that also up in the Bronx. That's what I'm I mean. Sure like, there was, yeah. He didn't just keep it there. Like yeah. he was like up near Pelham Bay, you know, yeah. like where Duster and the, the Mad PJ and the Med Fade. Uh, PJ, he did that same wall. Uh, you know, yeah. the Med, the MED, and the, the Fade, and PJ, they did big blockbusters up there. There was yeah. another bunch there, Med and them. They were doing some nice shit, too, from the Bronx, but... Yeah, probably yeah. a guy that doesn't get talked about as, that much, Mirage. Who, I, yeah, guess. Yeah, I guess yeah, only yeah. if you're from a certain area or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, listen, man, this was, this was freaking great again. I yeah. think it was a cool part two to our little uh, thing here. Yeah, man, I love it, man. I love doing your channel, man. You go in depth, man. I think it was you know, awesome. you're good, yeah. yeah. I mean, you ask me things, you know, other people, I don't know, they kind of skip over it. Maybe it's because it's they're from a different generation or something like that. Or, or th 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 their knowledge of the topic is different or something, you know. Yeah. But yeah, no, I love doing your things, man. Yeah. Appreciate it, man. And, um, uh, you know, we'll get this up. It'll be a great part two. And uh, you have any last words before we get, before we get, get out of here? Shout outs to Mirage. Shout outs to Baron, you know. Rest in peace, Mirage. Rest in peace to all these people that yeah. are dead, man. I would have to do a whole new episode. Yeah. They're all, like they're all dead. Yeah. <laughs> like all of them. Like John John, Frankie Gator, like everyone. Except Corn. for my brother. And yeah. he's, all, like, he's not getting yeah. out. 2039, my brother. Jeez. Eligible for parole, man. Wow. Yeah. But, um... No, thank you all, man, for your time, man. That's it. Great, and I'll post your channel up, of course, in the description of this video. We'll talk about it. I know uh, I got, I say, I got a decent amount of subs coming over to my channel after I did the interview with you. Oh, that's cool. Just people yeah. interested in your channel. They saw that you did an interview somewhere else. So I hope that happens again. Yeah. And well, I'll, mention it, I'll mention it. I'll mention it. I'm supposed to drop one today. I just, awesome. Uh, you know, I did one for Patreon, a little thing, man. That was it. But 
Very yeah, cool. tonight I'll tell them, uh, you know, to check it out and stuff. I don't know when you're going to drop it. But yeah, you know. we'll get it up soon. I'll let you yeah. know. And uh, yeah. All right, man. It's this always a great. pleasure. I like